Hey everyone, in this video we'll continue with the collision theory and specifically look at how the theory relates to the concept of equilibrium. So just to remind you that collision theory looks at the reaction rate of a chemical reaction and it's quite useful in using the theory to understand the concept of equilibrium and in this video when I refer to the word equilibrium I specifically mean dynamic equilibrium. And just to remind you what a dynamic equilibrium is it's a state of a reaction where the rates of the forward and the reverse reactions are exactly equal. The, one of the main reasons why we use collision theory to understand equilibrium is because it explains why all reversible reactions will eventually reach the state of equilibrium. Doesn't matter where they start with. So hopefully by the end of this video, you understand why this is the case. Now in this video to illustrate all of the concepts that we'll be discussing will use a very specific reaction that is the reversible equilibrium between dinitrogen tetroxide and its product after decomposition and that is nitrogen dioxide here. If we have a closed system whereby at the beginning of the system we've only got some amount of dinitrogen tetroxide these molecules of N2O4 will decompose to produce NO2. As that happens, the concentration of N2O4 will decrease, which results in a decrease in collision rate between these molecules. So what you will see is that the forward reaction rate decreases, and that's due to, again, the reduced collision rate between these molecules of N2O4. Arrow for the Ford reaction, as the amount of N2O4 decreases, you can imagine the amount of NO2 will increase. So as the NO2 forms, they can also collide and result in the reverse reaction to reform N2O4. So these molecules here that are formed due to the Ford reaction, they now can collide together to reform the reactant, that is the N2O4. So you'll get both a forward reaction and a reverse reaction after the formation of NO2. In the beginning of the reaction, it is important to note that the forward reaction rate is greater than the reverse reaction rate. So here I've illustrated that concept by giving you a much longer arrow to represent the forward reaction rate and a much shorter one to represent the reverse reaction rate. And again, the reason for this difference is simply due to the fact that we've got a much bigger amount of N2O4 at the beginning, giving us a greater reaction rate. Since the forward reaction rate is greater and faster than the reverse reaction rate, at the beginning, what we will see is a net decrease in N2O4, so the reactants of the forward reaction, and simultaneously a net increase in NO2. So that is the product of this reaction. However, as the amount of N2O4 decreases, the collision between these molecules will also decrease. And that leads to the rate of the Ford reaction gradually decreasing. As you form more NO2 molecules from the Ford reaction, the collision rate between NO2 molecules will subsequently increase. So therefore, the rate of the reverse reaction will gradually increase. So as the Ford reaction decreases and as the reverse reaction increases, this will continue until the rate of the two reactions become equal. And when they become equal, the reaction achieves the equilibrium. Now, at the state of equilibrium, there's something that's important I must remind you, and that is at this point of equilibrium, the forward and the reverse reactions, they still occur, because the molecules still react and collide with one another to result in a forward and reverse reaction. The only thing that you need to keep in mind is that yes, even though they do still occur, they occur at the same rate, which is what defines a dynamic equilibrium in the first place. However, since they occur at the same rate, you will not observe any changes in the concentrations of N2O4, the reactant, and any concentration changes in NO2, the product. So this is to remind you that in a dynamic equilibrium, there is still microscopic change referring to the fact that the molecules still move back and forth between the reactant and the products. But there is no macroscopic change, meaning that if you observe the total and the overall concentration of each reactant and product, you will not see any changes. So this animation here is to illustrate that idea. As you can see, as one molecule of N2O4 undergoes a forward reaction, 
it will subsequently produce two molecules of NO2. But at the same time, two molecules of NO2 will undergo the reverse reaction to reproduce one molecule of N2O4. So even though the molecules are moving back and forth, there is no net change in the total amount of each of the products and reactants. Now this is to highlight the main idea that we discussed in the previous slide, and that is a reversible reaction will always achieve and reach a state of equilibrium. The first graph here on the left hand side shows you the changes in reaction rate of the forward and reverse reaction from the very beginning until it reaches equilibrium. So as we saw, the forward reaction is the highest at the beginning, while the reverse reaction started at zero because we simply had no products at the beginning. As the reaction proceeds, the forward reaction rate decreases due to the loss of reactants, while the reverse reaction increases due to the formation of products. So as one decreases and the other increases, eventually they will get to the point where they become equal. And when that happens, the reaction achieves a state of equilibrium. What about changes in concentration? So as we saw at the beginning, we've got some amount of N2O4 and zero concentrations of NO2. As the forward reaction proceeds, the amount of N2O4 decreases and the amount of NO2 increases. When they reach the state of equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction will become equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. So like we said before, there will be no macroscopic changes, meaning that the concentration of the product and the reactant in blue, they will remain the same and not change over time. So by comparing these two graphs, I want to highlight one important concept, and that is at equilibrium, your rate of reaction must be equal but your concentrations of product and reactants, they don't necessarily have to be equal. And in fact, most reactions, when they reach the state of equilibrium, the concentrations of the reactant and product are almost always not equal. Now we'll move on to the concept of equilibrium disturbance. So in the collision theory, remember that there are three main factors which affect the collision rates. And these are concentration of reactants and or products, the pressure and volume of the system, as well as the temperature of the system. What we'll be discussing using the collision theory further in relation to equilibrium is the following question. What happens if one of these factors listed above changes? So let's look at concentration first. So suppose that we have the same reaction as before, so that's a reversible equilibrium between N2O4 and nitrogen dioxide. Initially, the system is at equilibrium, meaning that the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. And as you can see here, as one molecule of N2O4 breaks down to form two molecules of NO2, the two molecules of NO2 can subsequently undergo the reverse reaction to reproduce that one molecule of N2O4. What happens if we increase the concentration of N2O4? So increasing the concentration of the reactants will subsequently increase the collision rates between these molecules. An increase in collision rate increases the rate of reaction. So as you can see, my forward reaction becomes faster than my reverse reaction. The result of that is that the system is no longer at equilibrium because the two rates of the forward and reverse reactions are no longer equal. What will happen next is that the reactant concentration will decrease and the product concentration will increase. And as you can see here, we've got more molecules of the reactants colliding to form product. As that continues, the amount of reactant decreases, which results in a decrease in forward reaction. And the amount of product will increase, resulting in an increase in reverse reaction. This change will continue until the rate of the forward and reverse reaction become equal. So as you can see, by increasing the concentration, of one of the reactants or products, the system manages to find its way and to return to equilibrium. The next two factors are pressure and volume. Pressure and volume changes affect gases only. This is because gases occupy the greatest volume. So any changes in pressure or volume will affect their concentration. An increase in pressure or a reduction in volume increases the concentration of all gases. This leads to an increased collision rate between them. So since both compounds in this reaction are gases, the collision rates between reactants and products are increased. 
However, this is what you need to know for pressure and volume changes. Collision rate always changes more for the side of the reaction that has more particles. To determine which side has more particles, we need to compare the reaction coefficient of each compound. There are more particles on the product side compared to the reactant side, as you can see by the 1 versus 2 molar ratio. As a result, the reverse reaction rate becomes faster than the forward reaction rate. This causes a concentration of N2O4, the reactant, to increase and the rate of the forward reaction to increase. At the same time, the concentration of nitrogen dioxide, NO2, decreases and so does the rate of the reverse reaction. This continues until the rate of both reactions become equal. This is when the reaction returns to equilibrium. The last factor that affects equilibrium is temperature. The effect of temperature change on an equilibrium depends on the enthalpy change, that is the delta H of the reaction. The enthalpy change of this reaction is positive, so it is endothermic. It is important to remember that if the forward reaction is endothermic, then the reverse reaction will be exothermic. Before I explain the effect of temperature, I want to remind you that particles of energy must be greater than the activation energy in order to result in a reaction upon collision. A higher temperature increases particles' energy so that more particles in a chemical system will have enough energy to react. Not only this, the additional energy also increases the rate of collision between particles. Both effects will increase the rate of both forward and reverse reaction. However, remember this. A change in temperature always affects the endothermic reaction more. So in this case of an increase in temperature, the endothermic reaction is favoured. In this example, the rate of the forward reaction, which is endothermic as you can see, increases more than the reverse reaction. Since the rate of forward reaction is greater than the reverse reaction, the concentration of reactants will decrease and that of the product will increase. This will cause the forward reaction rate to decrease and the reverse reaction rate to increase. As this continues, the system will return to equilibrium. Besides being simple, there's actually another reason why I chose to use the reaction between N2O4 and NO2 as my example. That is, the two gases have very distinct colours. N2O4 is colourless, whereas nitrogen dioxide has a brown appearance. So as the two gases change in concentration, the colour of the gas mixture will also change, as you can see. Let's say at the beginning, we have a large amount of N2O4 and very few molecules of NO2. And as such, the mixture will have an almost colourless appearance. Since the collision rate between N2O4 molecules is much greater than that between NO2 molecules, the forward reaction at the beginning will be much faster than the reverse reaction. This causes the concentration of N2O4 to decrease and that of nitrogen dioxide to increase. And as you can see, that transition is shown between image one and image two. This color change will continue until the system reaches a dynamic equilibrium where the rate of the forward and reverse reaction become equal. At equilibrium, the color remains unchanged because the concentration of N2O4 and NO2 are not changing. So the macroscopic appearance remains unchanged However, I want to remind you that there are still microscopic changes as molecules are still colliding with one another and hence undergoing forward and reverse reactions. The last thing I want to talk about is a catalyst and its effect on equilibrium. The reason why I've left this at the end of the video is because a catalyst actually does not disturb an equilibrium system. Here's why. A catalyst increases the rate of both forward and reverse reactions by reducing the activation energy. What's special about catalyst, however, is that it increases the two rates equally. So an equilibrium system will remain undisturbed as the rates of the forward and reverse reaction remain equal. So I want to quickly summarize what we talked about in this module. A system at equilibrium is disturbed when one of the following changes occur. The first two we talked about are concentration and pressure and volume. Within pressure and volume, it is important for you to remember these two rules. An increase in pressure will favour the reaction that will produce less gas mole particles. 
a decrease in pressure will favor the reaction that will produce more gas particles. So it is important for you to know how to determine which side of the reaction has more or less gas particles. The third factor is temperature. And again, we've got two rules that you need to know. The first is an increase in temperature favors the endothermic reaction. So that is the endothermic reaction will become faster than the exothermic reaction. Vice versa, a decrease in temperature will favor the exothermic reaction. And so the exothermic reaction will become faster than the endothermic reaction.